20 or so. 15 to 20 would be fine. Uh, I, I hope that's... Well, that's great. I, I've been working for, for some time, uh, dear colleagues, on uh, the question of how uh, the leading uh, philanthropists in the world, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and especially Bill Gates, how he's um, established such power. And I'm going to offer this in as critical a way as I can. I hope no one will be offended. I'm, I'm going to be extremely critical of what's called philanthrocapitalism, which is um, a term that's been used more and more in academic literature, uh, partly to illustrate that this isn't really just about giving and solving social problems. It's about re-engineering society. And I would argue um, that we're not being critical enough as academics. And one of the most embarrassing processes is full unfolding now. I don't know, is anybody in the house aware of, a, of an easing called New Frame or of what's happened in the largest trade union in South Africa? It's the National Union of Metal Workers. And some would argue that this is really a function of a philanthropist, a man called Roy Singham, who made some say over a billion dollars in the IT sector with a small software house that then grew and grew called ThoughtWorks. And he sold and he uh, allied not with any attempt to change capitalism for the better, but to overthrow it. But the, the vehicles he's chosen and the ideology within the left, which is uh, sometimes called neo-Maoism, and the disastrous effect that he's had, I, I, I'm sure you're all aware of if you're watching, say, the Daily Maverick or the Amabungani expose last week. Is, is that something anyone's aware of? I think we have a similar problem. And I would uh, attribute some of the worst problems in the world, such as the COVID pandemic, to the way in which Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Bill especially, I'll really focus on him, I don't have anything against Melinda, but I think his orientation as a capitalist who's so concerned with intellectual property has meant that we probably had millions of deaths over the last 18 months that were unnecessary because of the slow rollout of vaccines in turn because of uh, the intellectual property waiver. And I'm sure all of you in the house know that, that uh, President Sir Ramaphosa, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, uh, Kenyan uh, Eswatini and leaders, as well as actually over a hundred countries have tried in the World Trade Organization to do away with this tyranny, which destroys the idea of a global public good. But it's really one philanthropist and his ability to work at Oxford University, especially with AstraZeneca's partners there, that prevented that from becoming a generic medicine. And indeed, generally, as the West has, I think, you know, utterly irresponsibly maintained that lock on intellectual property on the vaccines and treatments for COVID. I, if anyone in the house would like to dispute it, I'd love to learn, is there any rationale, especially for the Germans, the Brits, the Swiss, and the Norwegians, the French and the, the US actually did begin to surrender on this point, but we had a really terrible experience with the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Ngozi Okonji Awala, bending to those European big pharma corps and their pressure and doing a deal a, a few weeks ago that was widely condemned as basically maintaining this. And I would attribute this um, to Bill Gates, an intellectual property um, fanatic, because his Windows software from which he earned the vast bulk of his wealth was held through a cutthroat and illegal approach that was then prosecuted. He also had offshore tax avoidance practices that uh, meant the $4 billion a year that Gates has been doing as, as gifts is far outweighed by the profits from this illicit financial flows. I think when a, a cartoonist like Zapiro talks about big pharma corps mass murder section, it's really about the way in which Bill Gates made his money and has socially engineered. So part of the paper that I've done, I'll send it to you all uh, online at least. Um, and that is really about the way in which we've had to see a, a resistance to Bill Gates and it came in the form of the treatment action campaign without time to, to go through this heroic struggle two decades ago. It was sufficient to make an exemption in the World Trade Organization trade related intellectual property system so that we could get these generic medicines thanks to the treatment action campaign. Zaki Ahmed, Buya Sekadabula, President Mandela had helped against, of course, President Thabo Mbeki, uh, Mbeki's AIDS denialism and refusal to promote this. And he was over, overcome by this pressure from below. And as a result, in South Africa, before the, the COVID pandemic, 
So life expectancy went from 52 to 65. And this is really the commoning of intellectual property that's, uh, um, I think, a critical force to decommodify uh, medicines and to destratify. I just wish our philanthropists would really take up these kinds of politics to deglobalize capital, make these medicines generically in local settings, which was done across the African continent, um, and to globalize solidarity. But when we see the number one philanthropist um, be uh, basically behaving as a greedy philanthropic capitalist, well, we're not watching that space and putting enough pressure, are we? We're, we're leaving it up to the social movements, especially when someone like Bill Gates has such a dubious history, right? Um, he's done the same if we can move from uh, the most important health uh, problems in the world, uh, where, by the way, Gates has been strongly criticized in The Lancet, to the climate catastrophe for the medium term, indeed for last week in Europe, for this week in forest fire settings all over uh, the, the global north, the climate disaster is upon us. And the solution for Bill Gates tends to take this form of philanthropic capitalism. It's a double orientation to markets and uh, to technology. The problem is that the technology, as you see in this graphic, which I'll be happy to, to discuss at length if anyone's interested, has all manner of what we call false solutions that are technological fixes to the climate catastrophe. They're really disasters where they've been tried, and I, I don't have time to go into it, but we hear, of, of course, in this country of, of carbon capture and storage, of trying to suck CO2 into the, um, into, the, into the ground. It's never worked. We've heard of Cape Town ship dropping iron filings in the ocean to create algae blooms that can sequester CO2, another false solution. These are the sorts of tech fixes, especially with genetically modified plants to, again, sequester. And so these, these are just not working and not up to the, up to the task. I'm a tech technophile. Show me a problem. I'll look for a technology to fix it. Well, these technologies, especially when it comes to food systems, um, as Vandana Shiba has shown, lead to a green revolution strategy that the Gates Foundation has moved on the food front. And we found this certainly six years ago when uh, Bill Gates gave the Mandela lecture. And then basically, as um, Lebahong Peko began to describe um, unveiled himself as actually the enemy of openness and innovation, uh, the enemy of entrepreneurship, the suppressor of vibrant competition in her lecture, um, without time to go into all of the arguments she made. Um, Gates is guilty of unaccountable business practices. And the way in which he gets away with it, other philanthropists often are attracted to as well, with the line of argument that governments, particularly those in Africa, are corrupt, therefore continues this logic, the companies and markets are better equipped to solve societal and economic problems and bring people closer to living together, as Lebohang Peko describes. We heard a little bit of that from uh, Jill Bates, not Bill Gates, Jill Bates this morning. And that concern about corruption is typically oriented towards the South African state. And the South African state is corrupt. You can see us way down at the bottom on the map. And you can see many uh, states in Africa uh, as very high ranking on Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. Um, and Jill Bates did acknowledge that this isn't just a problem of states. In the current 2022 version of the T uh, Transparency International report, our South African state ranks, as it did in 2020, 110th most corrupt among 180. That's actually not too bad, is it? I mean, that's not even in the top half of the corrupt states. Of course, under President Mandela and President Becky, and a little bit under President Zuma, our corruption ranking unfortunately fell. Uh, this isn't something only to do with the, the Guptas and, and the Zuma era. And I think one of the reasons is that we do have an extremely impressive corruption rating for corporations. Impressive if you uh, admire, uh, let's say, uh, the skill at which illicit financial flows, money laundering, bribery occur there in Santon. I was a bit nervous, I should be with you, but when I go to Santon, I realize, in this case, the last uh, report by PwC, the uh, very corrupt company, so it you know, takes one to know one, um, and they rank our businessmen in Santon tied with the Chinese behind only India as the most corrupt in the world. However, during the 2010s, we were the world fraud champs, the world money leader in money laundering, bribery, corruption, procurement, fraud, asset misappropriation, and cyber crime. What I would love all of you intellectuals and some of you practitioners in the house to do is look in the mirror. Are you critical enough 
of the corporates making money, of the tycoons. And as you can see in the photographs, in the case of Santon, you can usually tell who's guilty by the color of their skins. It's like mine. These are white folks in the C-suite, right? And they are number one in the world during the 2010s in corruption. Are students of philanthropy focusing enough the way we on the left should have when it came to Roy Singham? Because if we have the highest corporate crime rate in the world, then philanthropy is a scam. It's what Donald Trump did with his, uh, with his children. And they were called on it, right? Using their philanthropy as a way to money, uh, to, to money launder. Now, there's lots of ways in which we can do critiques of the way Bill and Melinda Gates have, have operated. I don't want to go into too much detail. I'll finish maybe with one case, which really shows the social engineering problems. And this is where Bill Gates on the left with a team and yes, you can tell them by the color of their skin, the top ranking researchers in the field in Durban get accolades for water studies. Water's hotly contested. There's a lot of it for rich people. There's not enough of it for the masses. And it was being privatized until social resistance, the Soweto Electricity Crisis Committee campaign against water privatization here in Johannesburg fought back and kicked out a French company, Suez, about um, 20 years ago. But the main point about this is that when there's not enough water, people protest. This is the case uh, number two for number one, Helen Zilla in that fine car. Uh, she was then the premier of the Western Cape when people were protesting the lack of sanitation in Kailicha. Now, um, if we go to Durban, we find um, Bill Gates developing what he called the um, toilet challenge, right, to reinvent the toilet. And without going into all the details, you can see he likes to sniff around in the townships of Durban, right? And he's blogging in 2010 that the head of Durban Water, Neil McLeod, who's uh, not facing us, he's to the left, has been a leader. Oh, there he is in the bottom, um, in thinking through how to improve sanitation for the poor. And the real dilemma here, the social engineering that Gates is part of, is to deny poor people water to flush, right? There's plenty of water. Some of you from Durban would know the Valley of a Thousand Hills, which is Inanda Kwamashu. It's where there's plenty of water because of the Inanda Dam. So it's not a shortage physically of water. It's their desire to be inexpensive, to give everybody enough, not water, to deny water, but to give a toilet technology which doesn't involve water. And what you can call it there is a... Um, a new and improved bucket system. There are two buckets. Uh, Bill Gates has been pushing this as one of the ways in which the toilet challenge can be met. No water in the toilet. Now, there's an ecological argument, but you can see if you're in Durban in one of these uh, urine diversion toilets, one of the uh, the, the uh, sort of buckets on the left where you see the black um, uh, casing is for urine, the other is for excrement. And in a city with the highest number of HIV positive people in the world, uh, which is also very humid, you know that you're not really going to get solid poo on the one side and liquid on the other. There's a terrible mix, especially with diarrhea. And the problem is 100,000 households in Durban were given this without any choice. This was imposed on them in these low-income areas um, outside what's called their urban development line. And dignity and hygiene simply sacrificed, leading to people just not using them. 97% of the people in a survey done by UKZN found actually we're not using them for toilets. They've become uh, loose. And this is really a geographic resegregation of Durban according to uh, sanitation access, right? And uh, as some of you would remember from before 1994, whites only or Europeans only signs when it came to water are very evocative. And this is really what we're seeing repeated again. Um, as I said, we've, we've got lots of ways in which people are fighting back as a result of the sort of resistance movements around the world against this sort of philanthropic capitalism aimed at social engineering for market solutions, not giving people uh, things like water because they can't afford the flesh or technological fixes that don't really work. Um, with so much at stake, um, I hope what we'll be able to do at some point is to talk critically about um, watchdogging philanthropists because if Bill Gates, the number one philanthropist, given the Mandela lecture, all the prestige South Africa can offer, if he does things of this sort, to slow social progress. I hope all of you are paying closer attention and bullshit detecting where it's needed when it comes to corporate philanthropy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, <laughs> you, yeah. you asked for 20 minutes. You did not use your 20 minutes. But, um, you, so we have uh, a bit of time uh, left. 
We will come to questions later. So uh, my way of dealing with this is uh, let everyone present and then we'll have questions later or comments uh, as it were. But uh, uh, nonetheless, thank you, Prof. Um, the next person in my list is uh, uh, Belinda. Uh, Belinda, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. You have your 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, all right. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as has been mentioned, my name is Belinda Chaora. I am with Severe Institute. Two of my colleagues are present with you this afternoon. Um, uh, that's Tendai Murisa and Eda Joa. And um, yes, I'm going to talk about the intersection of uh, philanthropy and business. And uh, going to explain a bit about the information that we've gathered when we were um, examining funding mechanisms for micro, small and medium enterprises. And we did the study in Zimbabwe. So um, most of the data, in fact, all of the data will be Specific, specific to MSMEs in Zimbabwe. So um, as an introduction, of course, um, you know, previous speakers uh, referred a lot uh, to the role philanthropy is playing um, in different areas. You know, we've talked about philanthropy um, in education, funding healthcare, um, just the previous speaker was talking about efforts, uh, whether they're good or bad to fund philanthropy in, um, in sort of healthcare and you know uh, whether it's failing or succeeding, that's a, another debate. But um, you know there are close linkages that exist for philanthropy and and business. Sorry, just uh, just a second. So there are close linkages that exist for philanthropy and business. Um, and historically, we've seen uh, the strong stance uh, that has been taken, not just by established businesses, um, but, uh, you know, through corporate uh, social responsibility um, initiatives, whether you're doing direct donations or gift matching or things along those lines. But we've seen um, solid entrepreneurs, you know, people who've uh, established rather entrepreneurs, people who have... Um, made lots of millions and have kind of pushed that threshold and have become high net worth individuals and then kind of giving back to the community. Um, earlier speakers talked about that um, and the role that they are playing um, in, in funding income generating activities. We've seen non-governmental organizations as well giving to micro, small and medium enterprises, but we do have a limited understanding of how families are giving directly to start up activities of micro, small and medium scale enterprises in an African context. And to understand, number one, the amounts that are being given, um, when is that giving taking place, and maybe the kind of relationships that are involved when that giving happens. So um, as, uh, you know, just as more background as well, um, Sub-Saharan Africa does have uh, one of the highest rates for startup activities. Um, and this is, these are figures coming from, from the last uh, few years. But we've also seen that venture capital is growing um, and significant. So not just venture capital, but also angel financing. Uh, and, but the challenge with venture capital, angel financing, there's a lot of focus on uh, uh, targeting sort of um, the the, the uh, technological um, innovations, the big tech innovations or the exciting innovations. And there's a lot of uh, industries that are kind of missed out, uh, but these are the industries that are keeping a lot of African families alive. Um, they might be the same industries that maybe their parents were involved in or generations have been involved in, um, and they are not exciting to your usual venture capitalist or angel financer. So those ones kind of get lost um, in translation when we're talking about angel financing or venture capital. And for African startups, the, bigger challenge, the biggest challenge that remains is access to financing. 
And uh, for Zimbabwean startups, of course, you know, where our data was collected and where our data focuses on is that um, the biggest challenge remains, um, you know, a hyperinflationary environment and uh, a lot of uh, the, the cost of capital remains very high um, and not just high, but then also even to access that capital, it is not an easy road. So um, this applies to all um, MSMEs in Africa, but now I'm going to kind of zero in um, on Zimbabwe specifically. So obviously high interest rates um, and there's a need for, for collateral, which not all micro, small, medium enterprises will have. Um, there's a huge uh, deterrent in the form of the cost of uh, finance. So the bank, uh, the transactions that will arise, you know, and obviously as well, the interest rates. Um, and then in terms of um, information, so a lot of uh, micro enterprises, uh, are, you know, there are people who might be found sort of at the bottom or middle of your wealth pyramid. Some of them may not have the right uh, lingo to speak when they go and they see a bank manager or somebody like that. And so they find themselves or they feel um, that they might be at a disadvantage and may not have the right words or the right um, information uh, to bring across when they're kind of trying to access uh, financing. And then uh, banking institutions and microfinance institutions and all these um, uh, institutions that are you know, handling money to their credit, they want to um, have a, a strong uh, know your customer uh, requirements. But when you're looking at it from the perspective of a, a micro enterprise, um, not all that information is easy to get. And not all of that, um, um, you know, just as uh, Jill's mentioned earlier in the morning, some of the requirements become so stringent, they become a deterrent rather than an incentive for success. And so, um, what we did, um, now going into the study that we carried out, um, we did a study of um, 1,400 MSMEs. And we were trying to look at the habits of small enterprises and trying to understand how do they handle money, um, where do they get money from, and how uh, we did it trying to look at inclusion, financial inclusion but then also trying to understand the habits of these enterprises when it comes to understanding or interacting with banking institutions. Um, what is their relationship? How often, how frequently do they use particular products and services? And as they're doing that, um, you know, what information can we get about those um, relationships with uh, different financial institutions? But at the same time, um, to understand the uh the the you know for a startup what does it mean where do you get your money from and then subsequently you know how do you use it so um i mean in the previous slide um there was a point they're saying that we use the classification of um the the ministry of uh, micro small and medium enterprises in zimbabwe to come up with our classifications of what a micro enterprise is what a small enterprise is what a medium enterprise is this information that you're seeing now is what we've gathered as the, in our sample, what was the average? So our micro enterprises on average are between one, have one to five employees, small enterprises have six to 10, medium enterprises have anything from 30 all the way up to 75. And then um, I'll focus on the micro ones, uh, the gross assets for those are less than 10,000 USD and an annual turnover uh, of less than 30,000. Um, and most of the enterprises that we interviewed um, are owned by men. Uh, so 56% of them were owned by men and 52% of them were in urban areas. Uh, so that will give you an idea of the kind of geographical um, distribution of those enterprises. And um, most of those, 71%, were micro enterprises and 26 were small, and um, only 3% were medium enterprises. And then um, it may not be clear, but the graph at in the top um, is showing you the, the, um, the age of the enterprise, because the older an enterprise is, it's easy to assume that they have access to, or they will have more access to financing. So we did want to kind of understand some of those relationships. 
Um, and uh, just under half of them are less than five years old, so one to five years old. So they are really in the startup stage. And uh, 29% are from six to 10 years old, slightly older, but um, yeah. And um, now when you try to want to kind of understand more deeply what happens um, when an enterprise grows in size and you're looking at the enterprise um, from a size um, perspective, you know, looking at the classification differences, um, micro enterprises, there wasn't much difference whether they were owned by men or women. But as you can see, the kind of section at the bottom, the larger an enterprise is, the more likely it is to be owned by a man. Um, and this, again, is specific for Zimbabwean enterprises. Now, coming to the reason for this conference and looking at philanthropy um, and um, the funding for startup establishments, what we found, um, you know, we asked a number of questions, uh, you know, like I said earlier, looking at their um, uh, behavior with loans, their behavior with um, uh, different uh, products and services, their behavior with uh, mobile money, um, all of those things. But what we found when we asked them, where do you get your money from as a startup? Uh, and 55% of them are saying we get our money from locally based family and friends. And that again is very key because these are locally based. So these are Zimbabwean based family and friends. 8% um, are getting that funding from family and friends based in the diaspora. Um, and you would think it would be the other way around, but um, it, it, it wasn't. Um, and then 8% again are getting um, uh, that uh, income from, from, from personal savings. And then the role of microfinance institutions, you know, is accounting for only 7% of our sample. Banks are 6%. Um, the government of Zimbabwe is down there 3%, and then local NGOs are at 1%. So already this is talking about um, uh, at the startup stage. So what we figured here and looking at this data is that, you know, startups cannot, um, they have no proof of concept. And the only people that they can prove their concept to are the people that they live with. <laughs> Um, and generally their family, their friends are more likely to take uh, a chance on them uh, rather than an institution. And some of this might be, um, you know, things that we would assume, but really there wasn't much data, you know, to kind of explain just how significant this practice is. So um, now when we're looking at uh, not necessarily a startup, but an enterprise that is entering into a, um, or trying to scale or trying to enter into a growth phase of their, of their business. Um, the contribution of family and friends does come down and the most significant um, contribution then comes that from the individual. So when you're looking at this data again, we can praise the, the impact of venture capitalists and angel finances because they have done a lot. But the reality on the ground for a lot of micro and small enterprises is that they haven't seen um, and begun to access those alternative forms of financing, even from formal financial institutions like banks and microfinance institutions, and then also from you know, angel financers or venture capitalists. And a lot of people are having to finance their own um, business operations once an enterprise starts. And then um, savings groups, rotating savings and lending groups um, are financing about 8% of that group. And then locally based family and friends, again, are coming in significant, uh, well, more significant than, um, than, you know, other, so your microfinance institutions, your government and, you know, credit unions. Um, but also what's significant is that business colleagues, um, you know, that uh, kind of, uh, a group that wasn't in existence before then becomes more significant as the enterprise starts to grow. And of course, in there, you would assume that an enterprise is starting to create new associations and, and new relationships. And then those new relationships become the, the, the source of access to, to continued funding um, as the enterprise uh, continues. Um, we did ask the people that we you know, um, interviewed to say, why did you, did you apply for a loan? And if you did, 
um, what were the reasons for your loan being rejected? Because um, some people may not have asked at all. Um, and for those who did uh, access loans, um, the biggest reason was saying, I do not have enough evidence of strong cash flow. And again, that comes back to the reason why people would then access funding from their family and their friends. Um, and a lot of people were then, or 25% were then saying, I don't meet uh, the criteria for uh, that access. Um, so even if you know, the, 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 the facility is there in an institution, I can't access it because I don't meet their requirements um, or I don't have enough evidence uh, for, for the cash flow. Um, even if it doesn't matter how long I've been operating for, maybe they, you know, I've been in business for six months, but I'm missing receipts or that sort of thing. So, um, yes, these things are important to an institution, but the reality on the ground for a lot of micro um, enterprises is that some of this information is missing. Um, and the only place where they can then access financing would then be to uh, speak to close family and friends. Now, looking at how much do they need? Well, um, across our sample, the average um, was about 6,800 US dollars. So that's kind of across the spectrum from micro all the way to medium. Um, but for micro enterprises, the, um, you know, and this is an average you know, of all of the, the enterprises that we interviewed, some of these amounts could go down to as little as 50 or 100 US dollars. But the average for a micro enterprise was um, 1,800 thereabouts, and for small, you know, about 14,000 US dollars, and then kind of rising for, for medium enterprises. But when you look at these figures, you can see that it's, it's not a lot of money. Um, these are small amounts of money when you consider um, the value that uh, that enterprise would then bring to, to a household. So, okay, uh, the, you have five minutes of your 20 minutes. Okay. All right. So going into, um, again, I think I'd already mentioned saying this, there's a, a gap um, in terms of what um, financing can do. Um, so whether it's from formal institutions, there's a gap in terms of financing micro enterprises. And we need to be more innovative in terms of targeting micro and small enterprises. Um, but at the same time, um, we need to be looking at how policy can be worked around. You know, I think Jill spoke about how um, requirements can be so stringent that they become, uh, they become deterrents rather than, you know, facilitators of progress. Um, and of course, uh, there is a huge opportunity for micro, um, for funding for micro, small and medium enterprises across across the the you know the financing spectrum and looking at it currently um the strength of family and the strength of friends is really what is uh pushing the startup ecosystem uh speaking specifically for zimbabwe um especially if you're looking at 55 percent uh, of of, um, uh, of enterprises being funded by family and friends um and again that means the financial sector is not as strong as it could be in terms of financing um, these, these small enterprises. And um, that is where I will end my presentation so that I don't take up the last two minutes <laughs> that I have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't have to stop you then. Um, we will hear from uh, Benjamin now on a recent approach to impact investing. Thank you. <coughs> I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, um, can you see that okay? I'm going to presume yes, unless somebody says no. Um, <coughs> so uh, I'm, I'm uh, Ben Eyre. I'm a, a research fellow at the University of Bologna in Italy. Um, I wasn't quite sure how much time I had, so I'm, I'm now understand I'm back on 20 minutes. So I'm, uh, I've sort of amended down, and then maybe now I'm in back up the length of the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about some research I'm undertaking um, 
about impact investing in Kenya and, and about why I think a relational approach is useful to, to doing it. Um, my research uh, kind of more broadly focuses on impact investing and on philanthropy, on uh, financial innovations and, and kind of innovative mechanisms um, to do philanthropy, whether it's you know, grant-based or, or um, different forms of investment. This particular research is focused on bonds and results-based finance. Um, so looking at both impact bonds and particularly at for different forms of green bonds. So now I'm going to talk about um, a, a forest bond, uh, an innovative form of a green bond that um, was launched in 2016 and between the end of 2016 and the end of 2021. Um, funded uh, efforts to combat deforestation in Kenya. It's ongoing research. I'm about a year in and have about another year still to do. And the Kenyan aspect of the, the, the fieldwork of the research is still to come. So for me, it's a really useful time um, to be able to kind of present the, what I'm doing. Um, and I thought one thing that's really attractive about the conference to me is that I don't know many of the people here. Um, you know, I've read the work of one or two, spoken to one or two and so with that in mind i'm going to give a very broad introduction of where i'm coming from um, and i hope that's useful i look forward to any feedback or thoughts or questions um, so my training is in in anthropology i did a phd in anthropology at the university of manchester um, and that brings kind of three relevant things to mind i think one of one of which is you know that that knowledge of interest in anthropological and sociological theory so the gift i think is relevant to many of the um, papers that, that we have heard and will hear about today technological innovation uh, in different ways and pro particularly problems with uh, technological innovation and assumptions about uh, how innovation happens um, a long-standing interest in power and development power relationships and development uh, and, and more broadly, in, in broad terms, this interest in relationships, so interest in um, understanding society through uh, particular relationships between people. Uh, obviously, there's a methodological component, so using ethnographic methods, participant observation. Um, now, traditionally, that means long-term fieldwork in, in often isolated rural communities, um, and that's still part of anthropology, but rather than... Um, that kind of focus, to me, what's important and interesting is this, this drive towards trying to understand the lived experience of, of different interlocutors within research, so to really understand and engage with their perspectives. Um, and to me, that rather than um, a kind of reductive distinction between quantitative and qualitative uh, research methods, which anthropologists have long been guilty of, in, in my opinion, is, is the focus. So I'm really interested in mixed methods. And again, that's another thing that makes this, this conference so interesting um, the, the kind of third thing about that that training where I'm coming from is an acknowledgement that anthropology while it's often very critical is also itself enmeshed in uh, colonial relationships and, and hierarchical research relationships and so rather than offering any kind of um, solution or, or excuse that I feel an acknowledgement and attempt to work with and, and against such hierarchies is, is one of the things I'm trying to do the other thing that informs my research is to quote um, Alan Fowler from uh, this morning, I'm a, um, a pracademic, I suppose, um, so I have a background in finance and philanthropy, uh, worked for, um, kind of before I started my PhD, I worked for an emerging markets fund, particularly looking at um, the impact of cultural factors on publicly listed companies' uh, valuations. And then from that, got to become involved in establishing uh, and running foundations and impact investing funds. Um, so to some extent, I'm sort of, uh, the, or have been in the past, the target of uh, Patrick's uh, well-aimed uh, ire and, and, and concern for and need, the need for critique. Um, but the, my move into academia kind of followed my own concerns about, um, so partly about the quality, my kind of way in was this concern about the quality of the evidence of the information um, that I had in my old position. I, lastly, I worked for the Charities Aid Foundation, which is where Jill works. I was based in the London office and looked after their kind of ultra high net worth philanthropy. Um, but I had some, some major misgivings about how we represented um, what we did. 
um, to clients and about the quality of our due diligence and our impact measurement and the, the nature of the claims we made. And, and in short, you know, the beneficiaries all but absent from the work that I did, the idea that we might be responsive to their needs and preferences was um, unrealistic. Uh, and there was very little room for discussion of power relationships. So at the end of kind of 2014, 2015, I became involved in that inner practitioner in that space of trying to engage explicitly with power relations. And my academic research does that now. Um, do you, so for, for much of the last kind of five or six years, I have explored a Gates Foundation funded project uh, in Rungwa district in Tanzania. Um, their efforts to instill a dairy value chain approach to cattle farming so that farmers could benefit from um, the, the, the kind of the value addition process and, and increase their incomes. I'm not going to talk about that today, but given that that's kind of very much enmeshed in the, the green revolution type thinking that, that Patrick's mentioned, that maybe others will talk about, I thought it was worth uh, mentioning it. The interlocutors with that research were kind of people living in rural Tanzania, but they were also those working for the INGO Heifer International and members of staff at the Gates Foundation. So I was trying to really grapple with and engage with each of their perspectives and not to prioritize one over the other and see how they came together. And that's the kind of approach that I'm, I'm going to talk about now. Um, in some ways, obviously, you know, I'm sure many people will be familiar with this kind of um, impact spectrum from grant making through to investment and in some ways i'm moving along that spectrum to the the investment end um, but i do i've been challenged in some presentations i've given in more academic well in, in other academic settings um, about the fact that i've neglected some of what anthropology has told us about development in the past so i'm not going to go through this in, in great detail but just to reflect on the fact that Anthropological engagement with development has long been very critical, um, often drawing on Foucault and interrogating development as an exercise in power. But more recently, anthropologists have, have started to prob problematize some of those assumptions and, and the idea that development is something that powerful people do to the powerless. Um, and if they've acknowledged, they've recognized that, that development is something people value on their own terms. And so instead started to explore the distributed agency that actually makes it happen, the work that people actually do, um, not just uh, the supposedly powerful development actors. And I'm kind of inspired by, by that. Um, and I think they've come up with some original insights. I, I'm, because of time, I'm just going to focus on the last one here. Um, I saw that Give Directly are speaking, or representative from speaking tomorrow. Um, you know, there's an interesting case that Mario Schmidt, an ethnographer, has shown where almost 50% um, of the intended beneficiaries of uh, Give Directly in, in a county in Western Kenya rejected what was supposedly a, an unconditional and very large cash grant um, to their great surprise. And he's explored some of the reasons that um, why that might happen and how the, the idea of unconditionality is highly problematic. Um, for the people that he, he lived among, where understanding uh, personal relationships involved in the flow of money is really important. And it's these kind of insights about, if you like, the distinction between the, the official script, what should happen, and the unofficial script, um, what often does happen and what people struggle to talk about that I'm quite interested in. So I'm going to talk about the, the International Finance Corporation's Forest Fund, Here's a picture of elephant, elephants in the Kasagao Corridor in um, coastal Kenya uh, and an effort to combat deforestation in this important area of biodiversity. But to do that means I need to trace the connection between this place and this place. So this is the New York Stock Exchange on Wall Street um, and a conveniently placed uh, garbage truck outside the advertising of the um, American uh, priorities in, in life, if you like, that, that some investors will claim this bond holds. This, the bond that the International Finance Corporation has created aims to incentivize um, the people that they blame for deforestation, smallholder farmers, cattle keepers, um, for, who, for chopping down trees, for firewood or clearances for pastoral land. It, it aims to incentivize them to provide them with money to stop chopping down those trees 
um, and to do other things instead. And it's an incredibly complex, or uh, it's a complex financial mechanism that provides a risk-free investment for U.S. pension funds, insurance companies, and others, and, and very wealthy people. And it relies on a mining company, BHP Billiton, uh, in order to, to provide them with that incentive. Um, and for me, ethnography really helps to disentangle this process. So I'm not just talking about long-term field work in, in the Cascade Corridor, in the project area, um, you know, which seems like a sort of exotic location from the US or from Europe, but trying to understand multiple perspectives, trying to grapple with the perspectives of the different people who together make this bond happen. And it comes from, initially, enormous critique of uh, BHP, BHP Billiton, as it was then known, uh, for its carbon emissions. And so they started in 2014 to actively pursue uh, the, the opportunity to, to develop a, a Red Plus strategy to combat deforestation. And the World Bank's uh, International Finance Corporation, their um, sustainable finance team, got in touch and discussed the possibility of developing a bond together. At the same time, a, a company called Wildlife Works, um, who had been working in the Cascade Corridor to, to combat deforestation, um, had you know run into to problems essentially. They they worked by selling carbon credits to major international companies who were polluters, so airlines, tech firms, that kind of thing. But the price of carbon created a very difficult environment for them to survive. And so an NGO called Conservation International, who'd been working with all of these different parties, managed to bring them together. And with international lawyers and investment bankers, almost all of whom received uh, extremely large amounts of money, uh, not through pro bono contracts as, as um, you know, commercial work to put together a pioneering forest bond. And the idea is that it's an extremely low risk investment, um, but a relatively modest one. So it pays, it paid 1.546%, so less than 2%, but extremely low risk um, that enabled uh, a range of investors to say they were contributing to um, battling deforestation. And it did that because they could be paid in either carbon credits or in money. And BHP, the mining company, guaranteed to buy any carbon credits that people didn't want. So, I mean, in a sense, there have been many greenwashing critiques of this bond. Um, and, and I'm not saying they're wrong at all. Um, but I think what that slightly discounts is the fact that the bond is is premised on indirect impacts. It's trying to create market for um, efforts to, to combat deforestation. And, and, and therefore, on that basis, all the key actors in the bond, almost all, claim that it's been a major success, even though no one has actually bought any carbon credits apart from BHP. Therefore, the extent to which it's made any difference whatsoever is, is questionable at best. And so for me, the, the, way to try to, the, the way to kind of break this down um, is helped by these by the study of, of development, the anthropological study of development, looking at who benefits, how those relations work. And, and to me, it seems that allowing multiple realities to coexist, so different people ha have a radically different understanding of what's happened through this bond, is key to impact investing, as it's key to all development. So what I'm, I'm trying to do now, what I'm in the process of doing, is trying to redraw. Okay. So uh, last okay. five minutes, please. Okay, thank you. I'll um, I'll I'll go on and just stop me when when you need to stop. Um, so this is the bond, the, the structure, the depiction given by the IFC on the prospectus that they give to investors. And what I'm saying is, let's you know, I'm in the process of trying to to redraw it to think about the difference that perspectives make, and and you know, this brings together a, an unusual range of actors with with a lot of clarity so partly i'm looking to um connect with california state school teachers because it's their money through the the pension uh, firm calsters which is the second largest pension firm worldwide i think with 300 billion dollars in assets under management is their money that's ultimately going to this but they have no choice in it. Uh, and then also to connect with people in castigan to think what they to think to understand more about their perspectives and therefore to construct a representation of what's happened and to really think about who's really doing the impact investing. What does that mean? And to question 
the nature of investment mandates. So firms say, we have to do this. A, a pension firm has to do this. An insurance company has to be prudent in the way it invests. But what does that mean for the environmental ideals they claim to hold? And, and what does that mean for the relational nature of poverty? Can you really do anything about poverty um, when it relies on making sure that the rich get richer with little to no risk? And, and so I'm trying to think a bit about, and I'll, I'll just finish here, the role of anthropology. So partly it's about description, and I think ethnographic methods help to draw out details that get lost. So they help to engage with the unofficial script that often can't be discussed. But also to raise, to, to engage, to explore interpretation. There's been a big debate between um, employees of Wildlife Works and um, critical um, academic commenters uh, looking at whether or not the, the project really does benefit people in the area it's operating in. But really, it's not about the facts or disputing observations about what's happened. It's about interpretation, particularly about property rights. And so rather than proposing anthropology as a mediator or an arbiter in this debate, what I'm suggesting is that, um, you know, it's an important, it's an opportunity to think about the nature of property and assets and what, what's good about them for different actors. So it's theoretical as well as methodological. And, and for me, you know, there are, there are broad and important questions that this is indicative of that, that I think we can explore through this relational approach. So questioning whose preferences count, questioning, you know, there's a positive move towards addressing power imbalance through philanthropy and, and impact investing. But to what extent can you give power away? And, and, and how do concepts like participation and community and locality, how do, how do they really work and who do they work for in practice? So I'll stop there, um, but thank you very much and uh, really enjoyed all the presentations so far. So far. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Benjamin. Uh, I am really, really interested in, in, in that particular paper, um, but also uh, probably the projects uh, down the line. But we have these conversations um, once others have uh, presented. We, Lillian, is Lillian in the house? Online? No? No. Okay. We're supposed to have uh, Marcy now. Uh, she just walked up. Where is she? Oh, she's here. Sorry. Uh, Marce, uh, you have your 20 minutes. Um, good afternoon. So as we set up, I'll just uh, say hello, introduce myself. My name is Marcy Murigi, um, born, bred in Nairobi, Kenya, but I've had the privilege to work all over uh, Africa, um, in my previous life, in the IT space, I was in project and consulting in IT, uh, but now I'm primarily in the nonprofit space, um, working in grants and um, organizational development. I'm just checking to see if we are all set, then, yeah, then I can start. I stand here as a practitioner, not as an academic, but today I, we, we picked up a very good word, a prac academic. Because I'm in both. I, one of the things that I realized as I was doing the research for the paper was a lot of the content that we are getting is from out of the continent, out of Africa. So a lot of research from um, other parts of the world just saying what is happening in Africa. So I feel like there's a lot of um, information gap that is uh, coming out of uh, that fact. So this is the title of my presentation. And I speak from my experience. Um, I work with 10, let me start with where I work. I work in Children's Mission Africa, which is a regional office of Children's Mission, um, which is headquartered in Sweden. Um, it's a foundation, thank you, thank you. It's a foundation um, headquartered in uh, Sweden, uh, where we, have, we, we, we give grants, we are a grant making organization but our focus is in capacity development or institutional um, strengthening. So I speak today from experience of the work we are doing in Africa. We work in 10 countries uh, with funding support, like I mentioned, but a lot of our work is around organizational development. So I'll start by just, uh, <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. I'm sorry about that. The battery, yeah? Um, I'll just start by saying something that we've heard a lot today. Um, there's a lot happening in the world. COVID being one of the things that has really reset our minds in terms of how things work, uh, uh, how, how, how we are surviving uh, in, in these times. We have issues around climate change and the difficulties that come with that. Uh, we have issues of conflict, not only in Africa, but all over the world. Um, and that's the reality of the time that we have now. Um, however, the reality is also that we have challenges that are unique, uh, unique to, to Africa. If you talk about COVID, how, how the rest of the world has experienced COVID has some differences with how we have experienced it as, as, as Africans. Uh, but one of the things that I've realized over the two years that we've been dealing with COVID is the dependency we have uh, to the rest of the world and the dangers of it. I'll give you an example of, uh, of one of our main funding partners uh, who have been very gracious and have been a very supportive uh, partner uh, from Sweden. And they have been supportive, but they have faced a lot of challenges over the last two years because they have to give back more uh, in Europe. They have had to deal with issues of refugees, for example, coming in from Ukraine uh, into Sweden. And so less funding is available to come uh, to, come to Africa as we, were, as we were used to. That's an obvious, uh, one of the obvious gaps that we have seen over uh, the last couple of years. Um, so as we, deal, uh, as we deal with our challenges, there's a resource challenge where we have a dependency to uh, funding that is coming external uh, uh, to, to Africa. Working in partnership with the rest of the world is not a problem. I think one of the things that we need to be uh, care truthful to is that partnership is good, but dependency uh, is where the challenge then comes in. Okay, thank you. Um, dependency is where the challenge comes in. Um, um, and, and I wanted to show you this example. This young man is called Eliud Kipchoge. Um, he is one of... Uh, the best long distance runners in, 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 in the world. And in 2020, he tried a challenge. Uh, he wanted to run the marathon in under two hours. The marathon is, you know, 42 kilometers under two hours. It has never been done. He broke the last record with just being over a few seconds over two hours. But now the challenge was to do it in less than two hours. So I want to show you something. Um, Eliud is the guy in white on this side. And then this is a team that help, helped him uh, reach the under two hours uh, uh, run. The team was set up in a very strategic way. I don't understand the science of it, but the idea was that they all played a role to make sure um, that he reached his goal of under two hours. There was someone who was doing, you know, just helping him keep the pace knowing that he re if he ran at this, space, at this space, he would arrive at his destination in under two hours. Others were windbreakers, because the wind you know, determines speed and things like that. Why I'm using this anal analogy is because this is what we have, uh, the reality of how, how, how development looks like. I want us to look at Eliud in white as, as dignity, as welfare and all of us as the team that will ensure that Africa and you know, the rest of the world lives in a place where everybody's living uh, to their fullest potential. I am happy to be here today because academia is one of the guys in black. Uh, the philanthropy uh, teams and people who are thinking around issues of philanthropy is one of the guys behind there. And when we do this thing together, then uh, we're able to ensure that Eliud meets um, his target. But this is one of the things that we've seen as a big challenge. And I'm, again, speaking from uh, experience. We work with 10 partners uh, in 10 different countries in Africa. And one of the, some of the issues that we know they're grappling with as per their feedback is one, um, 
relies on one source of funding. So when that funding, you know, for some reason is not able to come through, those guys are stuck. Another challenge that we have seen uh, come up a lot is just lack of uh, limited knowledge on just technical things around you know, writing a proposal. Um, a funding partner says, you know, send me a proposal, send me a report, send me this and that, and there's a, limit, uh, a limitation in terms of the knowledge that is available. Another limitation is issues of boards and retention of human resource um, as part of the things that challenge us in terms of reaching to a place where we want Elliot to reach. And Elliot here is just an example of, of, of development. So this is what we have done as Children's Mission. Um, we, we are very heavy on the word capacity. And Collins uh, Dictionary describes or defines capacity as the ability or power to contain, absorb, and hold. And why that word is important today as I present is as we talk about African philanthropy, my question as I was processing this was, are we able to contain, absorb, and hold uh, the ability to be part of the team that makes sure that we have transformation, that we achieve dignity for all, that we achieve all the services that we, th we, we want every African uh, to have and you know, the rest of the world to have. And, and this is where organizational development comes in. I propose to you, and part of the work that I have been researching um, as I lead the work um, of capacity building in my organization, is that we need vehicles that are so well established, that are so well oiled, that are so well resourced, that they are able to help us achieve those things. Um, institutions that have trust, have integrity, that have the ability, that they have the capacity uh, to reach, uh, to reach where we want to go. So I'll give you an example of one of our initiatives, uh, which we call STRONG. STRONG is an acronym for Sustainable, Transparent, Resilient, Organized, Noteworthy, Globally Oriented Organizations. And our belief is if we have organizations that can be described this way, then their work in their communities, their work where they are becomes more effective. We are driven by the vision of being effective being impactful. There's a lot of work. Since we were born and the people before us were born, there have always been, you know, NGOs. There have always been global organization, missionaries, you name it. But there are a lot of things that seem to not be making uh, the progress that we want them to make or we would want to have. So we believe that OD, organization development, is at the heart of being effective and impactful um, in, in how we do things. Um, how we've set up this is uh, something that Jill you know, started talking about earlier. We work with organizations that already are registered, are already operating in their own spaces, in their countries, in their communities, but are ready to move to the next step. One of the things that we have experienced a lot is that you have people who have seen a need in the community they have the desire to change it, so they do it and they take action. But then the question is about now moving to the next step and learning and growing uh, to the next step. Uh, the other challenge we see, again, is the issue of corruption. We've had it come up a few times today. And we've had Africa, fairly or unfairly, uh, really being questioned for its uh, integrity and issues of, uh, of, of trust because of, uh, of issues of corruption. And sometimes it's just, you know, just the desire to continue growing uh, and learning. So our approach is this, and I'll use this diagram to, uh, to illustrate our, our approach. We use uh, an agricultural uh, analogy uh, where we start with buying. We need to work, we work with organizations to just realize that this need to grow, need to be better, need to learn. And so, you know, we present this uh, to them. We start from a point of them realizing the, the place where what they want to achieve, the vision they have, meets uh, with the ability of the organization to perform. So the importance of OD is presented from that point of view. So once they buy it, then they're seeding, putting the seed on the ground. 
starting to just see what are the actual needs, what, what is happening uh, in the world, what is the reality of uh, NGOs, what's the reality of CSOs uh, in, the, in, in the space, what's the reality in the countries, a lot of what we call you know, uh, desktop reviews and such. And then we start uh, to start the work. The work starts with assessment. What do you have? And the assessments are split into three. We have the policy part, we have the tools, what tools allow you to deliver the policies that you've set up, and finally the, uh, the practice. How do you do what you say uh, you will do? Once the assessments are there, and this is more of a facilitation process as opposed to a, a prefect policeman process, we like organizations seeing the reality of their organizations for themselves uh, through questions, through tools that just help them just uh, review themselves. And then the sunlight is, you know, then there's opportunity for growth. What is the roadmap towards growth? And the roadmap is where the magic happens. Because then you take inten intentional steps towards strengthening your policies, strengthening the tools you have, and also strengthening um, um, the practice of what you do. Then you, you work on your, on your roadmap, continue adjusting if the changes are not happening as it should, and then of course evaluating the process over and over again, and then now making sure that you're able to continue learning. Uh, and, and, and the word learning is important to us because it's a culture, it's something you keep doing. An assessment is not a one, one day thing, it's something that you forever do uh, in your processes. I want to speak uh, towards the lessons that we've seen. Five minutes. The lessons that we have uh, picked up. One is that if you tie vision and growth, and this is from the work we've worked with our organizations uh, in Africa with Children's Mission, if you tie vision and growth uh, together, then you have, uh, you have a more likelihood of ownership by, by these organizations. Um, and this is because then they see, we want to get there, but we need to put some things in place to get where we want to get. Peer learning is something else that has really come up in OD. Um, and this is because um, sometimes when I come and train an organization, you know, like a teacher, you know, it's received well, but there's power in talking to another nonprofit, to another uh, institution that is doing and going through the same things. There's a lot of uh, sharing of best practices, relatability, inspiration, and practicality of that kind of learning. There's an important thing about just setting standards in the space which we feel like is not there, our reward system around growth, standards uh, in the philanthropy space, um, and so we feel like that's something that is missing and there's a lot of opportunity to, to set that up. And finally, I want to put in the terms cross-cutting issues. A lot of times we look at our work you know, in a linear, in a linear line. If I'm working on entrepreneurship development, uh, we forget to look at how climate influences that kind of work, how issues of peace, conflict um, influence things like that. Issues of gender, what does that mean to entrepreneurship? So incorporating cross-cutting cross issues uh, and different lenses has been one of the uh, key takeouts uh, of, of our work. And of course, the importance of incorporating innovation and technology as a tool, uh, as a tool of, um, as a tool of OD. Uh, finally, um, my call to action today is uh, to establish, let's set up institutions, let's start the work, but let's be ready to transform. And that takes a lot of learning uh, uh, that needs to happen along the way. And finally, there's need to resource. And for me, here resource is, as we give to works that directly go to community and resources that go directly into the community, let us dare to invest in organizational development, giving resource towards our growing organizations to be uh, what they need to be. Uh, and with that, I think I'm done. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Masi, Belinda, um, Patrick, uh, Benjamin, did I miss anyone else? I, can, I think that that is all that we got today. We had um, a few more papers, which, uh, but unfortunately, I, I, I'm not too sure what could have happened um, in this. But very interesting uh, papers. I think each and each and uh, every paper 
uh, presents interesting insights uh, with regards to the elements of resourcing uh, philanthropy in Africa from uh, public boards, uh, paper around um, the dangers of philanthropic capitalism and uh, the type of capture uh, that is there uh, to a particular element of social uh, engineering uh, and, and all that. Um, a very interesting paper on, uh, on, uh, on in Kenya about uh, impact investing in environment again. Then another one on Kenya again on uh, growing indigenous African organizations. And then Belinda on the intersections between philanthropy and S SMEs. MSEs. M SMEs. Okay, it's a, it's a mouthful. I can't, yeah. But it, all these, so what I'm going to do is invite the audience. We are not that many uh, to ask questions to enable uh, these conversations. Yeah, audience here, uh, please, those that have questions, you may shoot them as they were. Even, even fellow panelists are free to ask others uh, questions. Yeah, Alan? Um, sort of an observation and a question. Um, <clears throat> it sort of tries to connect uh, Patrick's presentation with with Benjamin in a way. Um, the sort of the critiques of of philanthropy based on endowments, um, of which uh, which is the Ford Foundation, which is philanthropic capitalism. A reading of the move towards what are called alternative instruments, uh, which is partly what Benjamin was describing with impact bonds. To what extent is the new instrumentation, Catholic philanthropy, impact bonds, angel investing, to some extent a reaction to the way that endowments dictate with relatively no accountability and no real feedback mechanisms of failure that influence how grant making happens. So a reading could be that the emergence of all these innovative types of venture, venture, venture philanthropy, let me use that bigger label, um, are potentially a reaction to a lot of the critiques of endowment-based philanthropy, which has grown since, well, not Carnegie and stuff, that was going on in India even before Carnegie, which nobody seems to recognize. Um, Grant-making foundations are older in India than they are in, in America. Would you share that reading of the advent of these alternative instruments um, are a reaction to some extent of the critiques of endowed foundations, or am I misreading that? So it's sort of a comment and a question and trying to connect between Patrick's uh, strident critique of financial capitalism of, with a particular image maker in, 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 um, in Bill Gates. And then the the venture philanthropy side of things, which a couple of presentations have spoken to. So those are sort of, is one a reaction to the other, or could it be understood as a reaction? Not that it's displaced philanthropic capitalism, but is trying to complement it in all sorts of ways to try and tackle its weaknesses and its critiques. So that's one. And the other is um, to, to the presentation just now of, of Mercy. Um, there is an enormous amount of literature on capacity development and OD, an enormous amount. It's been going on for years. And one of the things I think it's taught us is a, to make a distinction between capacity development for communities and informal ways of collective action and formal NGO registered type ways. And I'd be interested to know if she makes that distinction in how the approaches to informal collective action, if I can put it that way, non-registered, not necessarily with a bank account. 
Okay, and thank you. What I call horizontal. Uh, anyway, so that's my question to her. Thank you for putting okay, up okay. with me. Thank you, Prof. Faula. Uh, I can see a few more questions. Yeah, yes, please. Yes, thank you. One to one. Yeah. Okay, my audible. Thank you. This was such a profound presentation. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, Messi, I would like to know the success of what you guys are implementing. This is really important. You said there are challenges that you guys are identified, and I love the chart that you use, the agricultural stuff. It will be great to get the results. What are you guys doing, and what's the progress, and all of that. And to Benjamin, this was so good. From the multidisciplinary background to bring all of that together and have the ethnographic staff. I'm an anthropologist myself, so that was so good looking into anthropological development and it's, it's such a good paper, so it's not a question, just a comment. Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, Tendai? Yeah, just to, to Professor Bond. Ah, it's Tendai here. Good to see you, Prof. Uh, just one question What do we do with the capitalist class? Because you seem to be dismissive of even its potential to redistribute its wealth. Uh, so beyond Bill Gates, because I don't think, maybe it's unique, but I think it's a problematic class. What do, how do we deal with it? Good. Uh, Marcy has a question as well? Is there a question, comment? Or, yeah? A question uh, yeah. for Belinda. Yeah. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what the nonprofit space can learn from the startup space. A lot of funding is coming to, you know, to, to Africa. Like, for example, in Kenya, I know a lot of startups are getting heavy uh, funding. Uh, and a lot of the startup nonprofits, the ones that are young, are not uh, able to attract that level of funding. What can they borrow? What can they learn from, from, from their counterparts? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Masi. Uh, I, uh, before we have, um, I'm hoping that each one of you is, is registering the, the type of comments that, or questions they have to comment on. Uh, for Belinda, uh, again, an extremely interesting uh, uh, paper and research for that matter. But I, I struggle to find where is the philanthropy in this, and probably that is what uh, um, Mas is asking. Uh, either lessons from that or, or exactly that. I thought the funding element, probably there's an element of philanthropy in that, but I, I, didn't, I didn't see that coming out uh, clearly. So it would be interesting to, to hear a little bit more of that. And similar to Tendai uh, on Professor Board, he's a professor to me because um, he was in my uh, examinations panels all the way in my undergraduate years. I don't think he can even remember that. <laughs> but um, not undergraduate, sorry, in my master's. Um, uh, the philanthropic capitalists are uh, probably uh, the element that we could de describe the likes of uh, Carnegie uh, and others, as, as uh, Fowler has put it. And, and uh, like Tendai, I'm torn between what do we do to them? Um, if we do not overthrow the system completely, we probably stuck with them. So it's scraping uh, at least something out of them in the ways that they do. But uh, probably a more critical way to ask this is how can we ensure that they pay for all their sins in the best way possible uh, as opposed to, to, to the way they do, as a, as a way to them uh, throwing the, the scripts to us, uh, as it were. So I would, I would like to hear uh, a bit about that and uh, linking that to uh, all these fancy ideas about uh, climate justice, and um, you're probably going to, to what Benjamin is talking about. And with Benjamin, it reminds me of something that was done prior to the RED project many years ago, and I remember, because I, I know that part that we're talking about, Kazgao, uh, very well. There was a, a project of the Global Environmental Facility led by uh, UMAP uh, many years ago, before they metamorphosed with uh, IFC and uh, cert certain other things became RENs and all those other things. What, what lessons can we be able to learn from probably the more, uh, how do I call them, uh, intergovernmental initiatives that have, have had greater currency of acceptance uh, as opposed to these, uh, I don't know even how to describe 
the type of things that are happening where they say there's a lot of success, but nonetheless, no one has bought any of the carbon credits. Thank you. So you can uh, board, you can start, and then we go to Benjamin, and then uh, Belinda, and then Marcy, you will be last, as uh, the order was initially. Okay, that's uh, terrific. What a great uh, team. Aside from being frightened of being in Santon because of those Tsotsis that I told you about, so I try not to go there. Um, I'm embarrassed. I should be uh, there with you in the house. Uh, now, my uh, first uh, uh, question, I think, relates to um, the uh, the problem of, uh, let's call it a Polanyi struggle, structure struggle uh, kind of dilemma, right? Karl Polanyi uh, described the forces of a neoliberal economy and the double movement, right, where social protests emerge. I think... Um, Adam, that's uh, Alan. That's what you're getting at. Did the uh, resistance to the kind of overbearing character of uh, foundation capitalism, and not just by the way, Carnegie Ford started with its social engineering because Henry Ford actually called the Ford Foundation in its first um, initial Dearborn-based um, uh, uh, sort of existence the sociology department. So it was really about taking uh, a mishmash of European. Uh, American workers, Irish Americans, uh, German Americans, um, uh, Poles, all kinds of people, and, and and trying to make a new American out of them. And the origins of philanthropic capitalism can be found there and in social engineering in South Africa. We know the Carnegie Commission for its reports, um, the poor white problem in the 20s. So I describe those in the paper. Um, and yeah, there's been resistance. But I must uh, confess, as much as I'd like to say, Alan, that social resistance against, say, the likes of Bill Gates um, and, and, and all of these kind of objectionable things that he and others have been doing, uh, as strong as it often is, it I don't think is the reason for uh, more funding now flowing through what uh, Benjamin's described in the, the, the green bonds and uh, corporate social investments that have a high rate of return. Instead, I would attribute that shift because I don't think our team has been that strong in, in fighting back with, with a couple of exceptions I'll mention in a moment. I would attribute that shift to financialization, that the rates of profit in industrial capital, uh, aside from China, but in, in Western industrial capital, have been falling since the 1960s, hence a, a major shift of industrial, or let's call it productive capital abroad. And so the real profit rates uh, to be found in the West are in uh, financial, retail, uh, trade, uh, to some extent, of course, big data. And it's when you get financialized capitalism, which is um, a very high rate of return in finance and bubbling financial asset values compared to the sort of shrinking or declining um, productive base, that these sorts of financial innovations have emerged. And I think when Ben, if I can ask you, um, you see uh, bankers who can't even run their own financial markets with stability and soundness, and they're bubbling their money and our money really into all sorts of uh, fictitious capital forms, carbon trading, you know, let me call it privatization of the air, right? You take the air, you privatize it, you sell the right to pollute. It's, it's really a shocking concept when you think it's being basically managed by institutions, major banks with major problems of corruption, but also just an inability to keep their own markets intact from collapsing. And the Chinese financial markets at the moment, the real estate markets collapsing. These are the sorts of things that really worry me. And when I see the European emissions, um, uh, European Union emissions trading scheme lose 50% of its value um, on February 25, 26, 27, 28, in that three or four days after Putin invaded Ukraine, then I know this is not a proper way to run um, a solution to the climate crisis, right? These, these uh, gimmicks. I also find them gimmicks not only for all of the scams that are involved, but the very institutions promoting them are covering their bets. So the IFC, the target of your study, is also investing major funds in the natural gas industry in Africa, including in South Africa in Richards Bay, a $2 million grant to Transnet recently. 
to develop an L LNG plant. So they're still, you know, basically building a new version of fossil stranded assets and preparing to destroy uh, the planet. Then I think that brings me to ask um, Belita, because it's very interesting that Zimbabwe is also subject to financialization. I happen to do my PhD on the topic. And I found what you're interested in, those microfinance strategies, going back to the 1950s with the partnership ideology and the attempt to put uh, the urban uh, black population into debt. And then in the late 1970s through the Whitson Foundation. And in each case, you get a sort of ideology that finance will fix things. But I'm sure you know what the interest rate that the uh, Zimbabwe Reserve Bank charges today. It's 200 percent. Um, a few a weeks ago, it was 80%, but it's never really been below 30%. So I, I would come back to ask you, are you promoting and interested in a vehicle for development or instead for uh, underdevelopment through over-indebtedness? And usually microfinance makes a big mess of uh, local economies by promoting overproduction, especially for small traders. Also, with those very high interest rates, uh, there's a basically a usury involved. Um, so many of the critiques of these microfinance schemes, which would rarely work anywhere, including in a place like Zimbabwe, really boil down to an ideology that that if you can simply give people access to credit, the, they'll be drawn into market relations and they will succeed. And I think all the evidence we're looking at is the, the opposite. And that comes finally to the question, what do you do with a capitalist class like the South African white unpatriotic bourgeoisie? They move three to 7% of GDP out of the country in illicit financial flows. The extractive industries are the worst. I'm not saying anything controversial. This is what Tavo Mbeki's own commission has found. And South Africa is about to be tossed out or put onto a gray list in international financial markets. And I think one last thing is just, what do you do with them? I would take the uh, the lead from the people who looked at Bell Pottinger. They killed that company, right? It was a big London PR firm working for the Guptas. And secondly, the microfinance firm uh, that IFC invested in called Cash Paymaster Services, Black Sash killed them when they were doing very underhanded predatory financing associated with uh, South Africa's major cash grants program. So it does strike me that we have to deal with a, a bourgeoisie that is unpatriotic and corrupt. Let's look at Franz Fanon and his way to say, these are bourgeoisies that are underdeveloped because they're working within settler capitalism and global capitalism, maybe we need to take some broader lessons about delinking from those very systems. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Benjamin um, and uh, the other three, I don't think you'll have the luxury of all that time because there is a small break or a short break before uh, the next session. So if you limit your comments probably to two minutes max, so that, not, uh, two minutes, maybe a minute or so, uh, so that... Um, we have uh, about five minutes break uh, before the next session, please. And I apologize. I didn't know I was taking so much time. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, sure. Great. Um, uh, it, if you want me to, to go first, I, I agree with Patrick that um, in terms of Alan's question on whether impact bonds and this type of structure are a, are a critical response to endowments, that... I, I not really framed it like that, and I, for me that doesn't quite capture what's happening. But I do think there is something in in terms of ultra high net worth philanthropists being concerned about what happens to their endowments after they're dead, for example, and then they can't control them anymore. And so there is something around creating instruments which increase their control. So in a sense, that is a form of critical response, in the, but it's not in terms of ameliorating some of the problems of endowment-based philanthropy, I would say, from, from a dispassionate, uh, critical perspective or the non-ultra-high net worth perspective. Um, so it is a form of response, but I would say not necessarily one that makes me hopeful or, or positive. Um, in terms of um, the, the lessons, I, I find that very difficult because um, I, I think the positive things that I see in my work, um, and, you know, I'm on kind of a second, you know, postdoctoral study, and then I have a new study planned that will start next year. Um, 
it, it's the, the, the engagement with questions about power by some philanthropists. And so obviously, it's not the Gates Foundation. Perhaps it's Melinda Gates. I mean, I, I think there's diversity. The diversity among philanthropists is quite interesting, I think. So the potential that there might be people who are interested in questions about power and in really listening to their beneficiaries is, for me, what's positive and interesting there. But I'm sceptical and, and hesitant to be too, um, yeah, kind of free and giving any, any kind of positive lessons. I um, hope that's okay. Belinda? Hi, yeah, Jacob, thank you so much. Um, I'll try not to take too much time. Um, I think I'll start with the last one. Uh, where uh, uh, was it? Um, Patrick was talking about um, MFIs and um, are we advocating for, you know, kind of, um, you know, financing in that way? I think you're right to say that uh, the current system of microfinancing produces indebtedness, um, and there's lots of evidence to prove that. I think what I would be advocating for, and I'm so many others, would be a developmental um, financing, um, especially when you're looking at poor communities. Uh, yes, the interest rates are very high, not just in Zimbabwe, but many other uh, countries as well. And those are not sustainable for poor communities. So I, there's no way we could, you know, advocate for that. Um, but, um, and then I think Jacob was saying, you know, where is the funding or the philanthropy aspect? I think I was in the presentation was um, hoping to kind of highlight that there's a whole, there's a whole aspect of giving that people don't talk about, which is happening under the radar. Um, and that's the kind of solidarity that's happening in communities. Uh, if we could promote that, um, I think that would go a long way, not just for startups, um, but I think for a lot of other, you know, trickle down, even social enterprises um, in many respects, uh, you know, uh, and which would kind of subsequently fall and promote development. Uh, so, so to answer Jacob's question, where's the funding? Um, it's uh, it's happening under the radar. <laughs> I think um, that's you know what I was trying to to bring out in that presentation uh, that it, it's something people are not talking about, but it's there and it's happening. And this was just a small subset of the kind of information that we could pull out uh, from one study, and you know a lot of it was also accidental. Um, finding out what we did. Um, what can startups learn? Um, I, I'm not sure how to answer that, um, but I think just to say startups are, you know, you can imagine somebody who's starting a business is, um, doesn't have the wealth of information that um, a, an organization, you know, whether it's an NGO that has. And so they're really starting at a disadvantage. And so if there's something for us to learn, um, it would be to do more to build um, that ecosystem of startups, um, whether it's through information or providing um, access to developmental uh, forms of financing or promoting those forms of financing. You know, maybe that's where would, that's what I would say. one from Professor Allen, um, and that was a very good question. I think one of the things that we have done is to support both, and I think this is where philanthropists uh, come in, because they come with some flexibility. So uh, my organization works both with government uh, resources, uh, for example, CEDA, and then we work with uh, private philanthropists uh, and the like. We have found that um, there are certain bare minimums that, for example, a government uh, funding agency would expect uh, that a philanthropist might not necessarily be very keen on. For example, you know, number of policies and the number of years of uh, financing uh, records and so on. So we do have capacity development um, strategies that probably are geared towards the same result which is just to be established in, a, in an organized way, in a professional way, in an informed standard way, but the, 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 the means of delivery is different from 
um, how we do it for more formal um, organizations or institutions uh, compared to those who are a bit more informal. Uh, but we, we see opportunity also coming. Um, for example, you know, if it's audit um, reports, many funding partners will expect that. Um, so if you're not working slowly with organizations, no matter the, whether they are informal or formal, then we find that sometimes there's a loss of opportunity to partner, to get funding, uh, and so on. But we are very keen to say then that we are not making all organizations to be exactly the same. It's just to have some form of, uh, of order, uh, some form of uh, how things work in an, in an organized way. A final thing about that is there are three things that we try and support our partners uh, to put in place. One is strategy. It doesn't have to be a 40-page document, but it's just to say this is what we want to work towards over the next couple of you know, years or so. It can be simple, it can be diagrams, but every organization we work with, we slowly want to have them um, achieve that. The second thing is a finance kind of setup. Whether it's Excel, whether it's just very simple bookkeeping, or a bit more, um, more, uh, more established, like having you know, systems, uh, but we insist that fi uh, finances have to be organized in a way that can be tracked, that can build trust with the community, but also uh, with other stakeholders that come into play. And the third thing is just measuring results. We work with all partners to make sure that they can check are we getting to where we, uh, we are going. That can be in so many ways. Formal can be a million and one tools and systems. Informal can just be you know, the PRA kind of uh, systems that are there. So, but the results usually is just to get you organized and, and ordered. The second question was from Lucy. Some of the successes, um, one is staff retention. There's been a lot of brain drain uh, from Africa and especially this, the organizations indigenous to Africa not sometimes into private uh, uh, organizations, to government, but also to NGOs. And we have a lot of people moving to these you know, bigger organizations, maybe because of the um, personnel, uh, funding uh, available, and so forth. But then we lose great minds that could uh, help push the world. Um, impact, impact in the community has been big, uh, a, a big change that we have seen. Uh, we have a partner who was able to document their process of entrepreneurship training, for example. And through that, um, that guidebook, they have been able to establish three or four local uh, informal, uh, uh, informal organizations in their community who are also then transferring you know, knowledge on setting up businesses and so forth. And then we are seeing a community then able to do uh, a bit more. So documentation has helped um, um, yeah, help formalize that process and others to learn from it. And then finally, I think it's uh, funding. We've had partners who didn't um, had one funding partner, us, for ex uh, actually primarily um, my organization. But over the last three, four years, we are seeing them able to attract uh, a few more because they are more organized, they're better branded, they have, you know, uh, their finances are in order and so forth. So funding has also been a success we've seen, but it has taken time, not months, it's been a process of years, but we are starting okay. to see the process. Uh, colleagues, join me in thanking um, our presenters this afternoon. It's been a, a wonderful time for us. Unfortunately, we only have three minutes the next session because of that. Uh, it was terrible in keeping time. It looks like it. I should have been, I should have had a bell like uh, Professor Fowler. But uh, next time, I'll buy a bell and bring it along. So, but um, enjoy the remainder of the day. Thank you. Okay. You can rent.